Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's anti-money laundering AML webinar. The objective of today's webinar is to explain how you can comply with money laundering regulations and also explain the current risks that exist within the property industry. A copy of the slides and recording of this presentation will be available at the end. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A section. We also have some colleagues from HMRC who may be able to answer any straightforward questions throughout the presentation, so please type them into the chat box. Firstly, introductions. My name is Kelly Cronogue and I am joined by my colleague, Glenis Debelius. We are both finance profession assurance technical specialists here at RICS within the regulation department. We are joined today by Alan Patrick from HMRC, Stuart Young from ETIV Technologies and Ollie Thorntonberry from Third Fort. Chrissy O'Rourke, Head of Conduct Standards at RICS, will also be joining us for the Q&A section of this presentation. Here is an overview of the topics we are going to discuss today. We are going to talk about money laundering and the relevant regulations, an overview of the RICS professional statement, a summary of the national risk assessment of money laundering and terrorist financing, key emerging money laundering risks, the digital identity standard, practical steps for firms to comply with money laundering regulations, the Proceeds of Crime Act, AML compliance for small businesses, COVID-19 and AML risks, RICS's approach to support and assurance, and a Q&A section. The main presentation will take around an hour and we will have approximately 30 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer questions. First, I'm going to provide you with an introduction to money laundering. So what is money laundering and who needs to register for supervision? Money laundering is the process of concealing the source of proceeds of criminal activity to disguise their illegal origin. You may have heard this referred to before as cleaning or laundering money. Money laundering could take place through hiding, transferring and or recycling illicit money through one or more transactions or converting property into seemingly legitimate property. For RICS firms, HMRC is the supervisory body for money laundering and firms who are required by law to register include estate agents, letting agents where the rent received exceeds €10,000 per month, and high value dealers who deal in transactions of at least €10,000 in either one transaction or a series of linked transactions. Estate agents are the main facilitator in a property transaction. This is why they are required to register for money laundering supervision. UK property purchases can be an attractive method to launder illicit funds due to the large amounts of money involved and possible complex ownership structures. The letting of property involves a regular flow of funds and an inability to know the final destination of those funds, making it a potentially attractive method to facilitate money laundering. We'll be talking more about the specific risks that both estate and letting agents face later in the presentation. All firms required to register with HMRC could inadvertently become involved in facilitating money laundering if they do not have the appropriate controls in place. So what are the appropriate controls? The appropriate controls a firm registered with HMRC needs to have in place are contained in the money laundering, terrorist financing and transfer of funds information of payer regulations 2017. Below are the relevant sections from the regulations that we are going to cover during this presentation. Regulation 8 requires different types of relevant persons to register with a supervisory body and follow anti-money laundering regulations, as we have already discussed in the previous slide. Regulation 21 requires relevant persons to appoint a nominated officer who will be responsible for AML compliance within the firm. This is known as a money laundering reporting officer or MLRO. Under Regulation 18, 
firms must identify and assess the risk of money laundering and terrorist financing in its business. This written risk assessment must be provided to the supervisory body on request. Regulation 24 states that regular training must be provided to relevant employees on how to recognise and deal with activities that could give rise to money laundering. Regulation 27 requires that customer due diligence is undertaken to establish and verify the identity of all customers and the nature of the transaction. We will discuss each of these in more detail later on. In addition to the money laundering regulations, the RICS also has a professional statement on countering bribery and corruption, money laundering and terrorist financing. The professional statement became effective from the 1st of September 2019 and provides, provides both mandatory requirements and best practice in relation to anti-bribery and corruption and anti-money laundering and terrorist financing. The professional statement applies to all RICS members and all RICS regulated firms involved in work where there is a potential for bribery, corruption, money laundering and or terrorist financing. As you can see, this professional statement is not limited to those firms required to register with HMRC and all RICS regulated firms are under an obligation to not facilitate or be complicit in money laundering. All firms must have systems and training in place to prevent this whilst having regard to both the professional statement and money laundering regulations that we discussed in the previous slide. I'm now going to hand you over to Alan Patrick, who is the strategic lead for art market participants, estate agency businesses and letting agency businesses in economic crime supervision at HMRC. Alan is, Alan is going to talk you through the National Risk Assessment 2020 and the current risks facing estate agents and letting agents. Thank you, Kelly. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm going to look at the National Risk Assessment and then some of the risks for estate agents and letting agents. Uh, could we come to the next slide, please? Um, on screen, you'll see the risk scores. Um, the, the National Risk Assessment, the NRA, was updated okay. in December 2020. Um, there were changes in the risk scoring, as you can see, for property, estate agents and letting agents, which were covered for the first time. And I'm just going to look at them separately. For money laundering, the property risk rose from medium to high. Uh, UK property purchases remain an attractive method to launder illicit funds due to the large amounts that can be moved and the low levels of transparency of ownership or source of funds. Since 2017, law enforcement agencies have observed increased overseas buyers and overseas cash flows into the UK property market. The property sector as a whole is facilitated by a range of service providers, including legal services, estate and letting agency services and financial services, and often features the use of corporate structures. Therefore, the NRA chapters relating to all these services should also be read alongside this one to fully understand the interconnectors of sectors where money laundering it, it, it is where money is laundered through property. Uh, buying a property offers criminals an opportunity to make an investment while giving it the appearance of financial stability. Property prices in the UK have a reputation for increasing in value over long term. For a criminal, this means your money is generally safe, and when they sell, they will get more money if they had held it, for example, in a bank. If they buy a hotel, restaurant or similar business, this has a further advantage as a legitimate source of income, as well as providing an opportunity to launder money through that business. Criminals often purchase properties as long-term investments and to release their criminal funds. However, properties are also purchased and sold as a method to layer criminal funds. Criminals may abort a transaction, manipulate values and turn around purchase and resell in short time frames. While the speed of money movement involved in pro property purchase is slow compared with other methods. The large volumes that can be moved and the accessibility of the sector make it very attractive. It is suggested that criminals favour locations with high value properties, such as London or Edinburgh, or university towns, with London in particular considering highly desirable for overseas entities to operate a residential or commercial basin. 
It should be noted that commercial properties located outside of these regions can still facilitate money laundering due to their high value um, and their ability to conceal large sums of money as legitimate commercial transactions. Um, just looking at the EAB side for a second, as you can see on the screen, the, the risk for money laundering rose from low to medium. And yet the NRA actually states the reason for this. The increase in the score since 2017 is again a result of a greater understanding of the risks in the sector. And the increased law enforcement had observed in money laundering cases involving overseas buyers and use of complex structures. Um, overall, we have seen that EABs have seemed to have weaknesses in the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing controls. Common failings can, the, can be the lack of bespoke policies, controls and procedures aligned with an appropriate risk assessment. And this will be looked into more detail later on. We've also noticed that some EABs have an over-reliance on ID checking software, which they do not fully understand. Um, some businesses assume that this software would automatically do enhanced due diligence and check for politically exposed pers persons. Um, and that functionality may only be available if there was a if you've bought a premium package or may not be available at all. Um, we've also identified that some larger EABs with multiple branches, that the, they have the right policies, risk assessments and policies and procedures in place at head office, but that doesn't always, they don't always fail, they don't always adequately audit their branches for compliance. Um, we still have an issue with EABs who are trading without, without being registered. And we've also seen that the ones which are registered don't always have sufficient training in place. Um, for the letting agents, as you can see, again, that's, it was the first time it was assessed and it's assessed as medium. Um, the NRA assesses labs separately to estate agents as the risks do differ. Um, Although there is still a lack of complete understanding of the mitigation and the vulnerabilities in this sector, the ability to conceal the beneficial owners and destination of funds and the regular flow of funds makes it attractive for money laundering. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? I'm just going to look at some of the risks, um, which uh, firstly at EABs, and then we'll look at some of the ones for the labs. Um, super prime property. The high, this is the highest risk highlighted and has been the concern of money laundering by purchasing super prime property. What a business identifies as super prime will be reflected of factors such as the region and the competitiveness of the market, but it's usually within the top 5% of the local market values. There is a high number of the politically exposed persons that are most likely to buy super prime. And under the regulations, that means that enhanced due diligence needs to be undertaken on any of them. The idea here is to identify if their funds are com coming from any illicit, illicit activity. PEPs are from around the world, and they also include domestic ones, such as members of our parliament. We find that some customers want to use complex or offshore legal entities to buy or sell, and this can be done to help to evade paying taxes. Obviously, this can make it more difficult for an estate agent to correctly identify, identify beneficial owners. With a super prime property, even a 1% fee will mean a large sum of money which comes into that EAB. And thus an EAB may have some confliction between the law of the fee and possibly not complying with the regulations or stopping the, the transaction because of suspicion of money laundering. Residential property and commercial property. Um, we, gen we see that generally residential property poses a greater risk than commercial property. Um, this is because client turnover is higher, the property is easier to sell on, and it can be lived in using criminal funds. That doesn't though mean that the commercial property does not have also pose risks, uh, but particularly with office and retail space. Complex opaque company structures are less likely to raise suspicious, uh, suspicions in the commercial sector than in the residential market. Uh, Non-face-to-face -face customers, um, if you meet a customer face-to-face, -face, it gives you an opportunity to interact personally and verify the customer's ID. Uh, transactions made online, over the phone or via an intermediary are higher risk than those done face-to-face. -face. It reduces the exposure to the customer, decreases effective identification and thus increases the chances of money laundering. Um, and this is obviously even 
particularly true when you deal with customers in higher risk countries. And obviously with COVID and restrictions that have been in place, um, we, there has been an increase with sales done online and thus creates a higher risk. Uh, looking at country or geographic areas, um, you need to be aware of the risks about the location of a property in relation to the buyer and the location of the buyer and the seller. Some countries may have sanctions, embargoes or similar measures on them. Uh, some countries are identified as lacking appropriate anti-money money laundering or counter-terrorist financing laws. The regulations and other measures, or they provide funding or support for terrorist activities. Uh, they could also have significant levels of corruption or other criminal activity. It is important for EABs to consider each country by looking at things such as bribery, corruption and organised crime. In addition, businesses should also consider whether it's in a conflict, conflict zone or it is known to support terrorism or human trafficking. Um, you should also ideally be aware of political situations in other countries and say where a regime may be falling, but they may not be able to identify, so, so they may be able to identify a corrupt official who is seeking to launder their funds in preparation for a country being overthrown. Our advice is always to do a media check. Essentially, Google the overseas agent or individual and see what comes up. Um, unregistered EABs. Um, obviously, any individual or business who should be registered as an EAB or for a lab, um, but are not. And this could be either because they're unaware of the rules or they won't engage with the rules and purposely do not register. Obviously, there is an increased money laundering risk for, for a registered business who deals with an unregistered EAB or lab as they are unlikely to have the correct anti-money laundering measures in place. And lastly on the EAB is just looking at unusual financing. Um, in more recent years we've seen some rather interesting and unusual methods of financing a property. For example, uh, property prop sales concluded using crypto, crypto assets such as Bitcoin. Uh, we also sometimes see mortgage fraud taking place. This is usually done by the purchaser taking out a mortgage from a less than reputable bank in a high risk country. As soon as the transaction is complete, the full, of it, full amount of a mortgage is then paid off immediately. It will be when the EAB are having conversations with customers that unusual financing methods should crop up. Uh, could I go on to the next slide for the lab risks, please? So, as you're probably aware, um, letting agents or labs are a new sector for us to supervise and they came into scope on the regulations on the 10th of January. Um, on the screen is the definition of the definition from our regulations. Um, it is based upon a similar definition to an EAB, so they have similar wording. However, they are defined separately um, and have different risks. Um, you'll see on screen we've highlighted a couple of bits in yellow. Um, this is the sort of key parts when you're trying to work out if you're a letting agent or not. Um, and it's in in response to instructions received from and seeking to seeking to find. And that's what you need to look at to see if you are a letting agent or not. Um, and as you can see, it doesn't cover all letting agent work. It only covers the higher end of the sector. So it must be a monthly rent of 10,000 euros or more or an equivalent currency. So a letting agent would only need to register with us if they are letting a property above this amount rather than all letting agents. We have seen some issues with letting agents already registering with us who are trading well below the threshold but are doing it just because of um, instructions received from a bank. Um, for us as a supervisor you do not need to register with us, um, it's, it, you would need to have a further conversation with your bank. Um, could I have a next slide please? And just looking at a few general risks uh, for the lab side, um, just looking generally, um, the, I mean, the services offered by all letting agents and our labs uh, and our registered labs can be attracted to criminals uh, and money launderers. And this could be because of rental land and properties above the lab threshold are considered attractive um, for laundering illicit funds simply due to their high value. Uh, a property bought with illicit funds can be further profitable by renting it out and this can be done for both commercial and residential and can provide a legitimate source of income. Rental income may also be from illicit activities but using a lab which gives that, those funds legitimacy. Uh, landlords may have purchased a property with illicit funds 
tenants may be paying rent with illicit funds or the landlord and tenant may be part of the same criminal group, laundering their funds under the guise of rent payments. Unlike estate agents, labs do all, all labs will handle client money, including fees, deposits and rent, which obviously brings increased risks. And of course, there, a rent could also be on paper only and the tenant never taking up any occupancy. And these are known as ghost lets or worse, it could be used to house individuals who have been trafficked or enslaved. Um, we had lots of questions around holiday lets and whether they were in scope. And we've had a lot of look into this. And at the moment, it isn't uh, under a normal circumstance. Ho holiday lets are not deemed to be a, a, a lab for us. Um, a lot of this is due to duration as normally a rental agreement has a fixed time frame, say three to six months or longer, whereas most holiday, let, holiday lets are normally under 30 days. We know that's not always the case, but that's a general sort of rule. Um, we are keeping an eye on this to see what happens, to see if there is a move from traditional letting agents to the hospitality industry. And obviously if that happens or other methods develop, we will look at that and possibly make a change to the regulations. Um, commercial rents. A potential risk is that the commercial sector may be more vulnerable to complex letting arrangements, including overseas corporate entities where criminals wish to add extra layering to its money laundering efforts. For example, an overseas corporate entity controlled by criminals might acquire a high value commercial property in the UK using illicit funds, which have previously managed to launder and move offshore. It could then arrange for a commercial sector lab to let the property to another overseas corporate entity, which it also controls. Funds could flow from one to the other or via the, the lab, which would have no way of knowing that the landlord and tenant were connected and linked to criminality. Um, tenants normally pay rent by electronic, electronic transfer to the client's bank account. However, rent may be paid in cash direct to the letting agent's office or cash paid direct, directly into the letting agent's bank account. This enhances a risk if paid into a bank account. How does the letting agent know who paid the money into a bank? It could have been literally anybody. Um, repayments. Um, the churning of funds is, a, is another risk we have seen, although we do feel this is probably more commonplace to take place below the lab threshold, but we're, we're, again, something we're, we're trying to find more data on. And this is normally the way in which money can be deposited as cash into a letting agent's bank account and then paid back out with clean funds electronically a few days later. And of course, there's a possibility this process can be repeated on a regular basis. For example, a tenant can make a cash deposit, which could be, say, a month's rent. So the letting agent takes the property off the market, but delay on signing the tenancy agreement. Before the tenancy starts, the, tenancy, the tenant changes their mind and asks for a refund, which is paid back electronically. The letting agent would have no right to retain the tenancy deposit if a tenancy agreement had not been signed and the tenant had never moved in for the property. Obviously, now the money is now being cleaned through the letting agent. Um, a tenant may, ha may have to pay six to, six to 12 months rent in advance. And if this is paid in cash and then refunded electronically, the scale of the risk of money laundering increases. Uh, that's it from me for now. Uh, back to you, Kelly. Thank you, Alan. I'm now going to hand you over to Stuart Young, who is the founder of ETIV Technologies, and Stuart is going to discuss the digital identity standard. Great, thanks very much. I think as Alan has pointed out quite well there, we can see quite clearly the property is, is a high risk area. And it's, it's a very complex area because of the number of actors that are involved in the home buying and selling process of a residential property. And what the My Identity Scheme is doing is working to look at improving the standards of identity checking um, through the, the residential transaction, hopefully improving the process for the consumer as well and um, for the industry as a sector. So if we go on to the first slide, um, we can see that as a problem definition, you know, the consumers have to prove their identity up to five times through the transaction process and the different people who are asking for identity verification are often using different standards or processes or working to their own internal interpretations of the standards and processes and that quite often leads to inconsistency and indeed confusion and conflict for the consumer and the our understanding from the insurance industry and those that provide the PII cover for conveyancing firms is that 70% of all conveyancing 
transaction frauds relate back to identity fraud and can be linked back to that. So the My Identity Scheme is focusing on de-risking the process due to the values of the transactions that are taking place. Um, as Alan pointed out, the values of these are very, very high, although the frequency of, of the fraud might be considerably lower. So the complex nature of the sector and looking at all the actors that are involved and working to the different standards, we've been trying to look at saying, well, how can we create a set of standards that everyone can start to trust and rely on and reduce the uh, misinterpretation or the different interpretations of those standards. So the scheme is working to a set of government-backed standards and to work with identity providers that become certified through a process that they can evidence the standards that they're working to so that if a consumer gets their identity done through an identity provider, um, they can use that identity and share it with all the other relying parties through the process and the other service providers, relying parties can start to trust and rely on that identity. So a, a big part of the scheme is working with the identity providers to um, bring their standards up to a level that um, can be used against GPG-45 and AML rates, which if we go on to the next slide, so the government is working on legislation at the moment to build trust, looking at how to establish sufficient oversight of the UK digital identity standards. And this consultation is ongoing at the moment, and it sets out how a body could actually do this. So we're seeing that the GPG45 profiles, looking at how to, deter, how to determine how to achieve a level of confidence in a verified identity. And this is working to what's known as a level of confidence medium. And this is comparable or equivalent to the level of identity verification required in the money laundering regulations. So the government is proposing to create a permissive legal power to allow digital identities in the UK to be built on a greater range of trusted data sets and for government held attributes to be checked for validation purposes. So government have set out how, they, how we could build confidence in the legal validity of digital identities and attributes alongside the physical proofs of identity that businesses and individuals already trust, and which is as part of their commitment to increasing choice and confidence for the consumer. So the My Identity Scheme is specifically looking at identity verification and PEPs and sanctions of an individual. So the consumer or the client, as they go through the process, additional checks may, may still have to be carried out but if we can get the consumer, the client who's entering the home buying and selling process to get their ID and fee done at the outset to a much higher level of standard, the consumer then owns that and has the ability to share that with the other service providers through the process. So they go through an estate agent, they get their ID and fee done, they can then share that with their conveyancer, their solicitor, their mortgage intermediary and their lender. This helps towards reducing the friction for the consumers having to do it a number of times. It helps with the onboarding of the client on working with the other service providers through the process and improves the standard of identity because the mortgage lender, the solicitor, can start to trust and rely on the identity verification that has been created for that customer by, through an estate agent. But there's a number of profiles that are required to show how an identity can be assured. And if we go on to the next slide, we can see that there are this eight different levels of um, the, the eight different sets of, of, of levels of identity that can be that can be used for a consumer. We have to look at if we look at M1C, we can see that this is the land registry safe harbor um, profile for identity, but it only covers one profile. There are in fact eight, and indeed even potentially more different profiles that we have to take into account when dealing with customers and consumers and people that they don't all necessarily fit into the, the, the M1C profile, that they have a passport or an ID card or driving license. There are a lot of people out there who are digitally excluded or are unable to engage digitally. And this is, this is reflected if we look at issues around disabled people who can't go online or who find that online processes are quite difficult. Um, 
estimates are that there's about 4.3 million people that drop out of doing processes online because of due to inaccessibility of the website or the application that they're using. And this is a combined spending power of to the UK PLC of 11.75 billion pounds. It would be interesting to see what the breakup breakdown of that would be relating to housing. So the scheme is looking to make sure it covers all the, the, the sectors of society. If we go on to the next slide, um, what's become very important is this reliance or trust on the IDNV. We know that most people don't trust the identity verification carried out by an estate agent, so the conveyancer will do it again themselves. However, if we look at the regulations, this is very important to point out, is that a conveyancer, a mortgage lender, an intermediary can trust and use the identity carried out by an estate agent through a certified identity provider. So the DCMS framework is working towards meeting this criteria about certifying identity service providers. So the mortgage lender who's presented with the identity verification of a client, of a customer that's been done by an estate agent can check against the scheme that the identity provider is working to scheme standards. So the project that we're working on at the moment, the My Identity Digital Identity Standard, is working with a number of identity service providers to bring them up into the scheme so that they become certified through the DCMS framework and working through the home buying selling process that the various service providers can see which identity providers are certified, working to an agreed standard and meeting the regulations requirement to help improve the standards of ID and V and helping to de-risk the process. If we go to the final slide, um, we can see, so what does that mean in very simple practical terms? Well, what it means on the left-hand side, we can see here are a, a range, a random, this is just random range of identity providers operating in the home buying and selling sector, working under the scheme. And working through a hub model, they contract with the hub. And on the right-hand side, we can see all the service providers that would procure an IDNV as part of the transaction process. The beauty for them now is that they can just contract with the hub. They don't have to contract with each in individual identity provider if they don't want to. They can use a range of identity providers for different services as part of their, their service provision to the consumer to help with home buying and selling. And very importantly, the lender or IFA, whoever's further down the food chain can actually see the identity providers who are working as part of the scheme. So when a consumer, if a, con a customer comes to them, the estate agent, the conveyancer or the IFA can actually point the customer to the scheme to pick an identity provider or pick an identity provider that they already work with as, who are working as part of the scheme. It's very important that the consumer has choice in all this and has the ability to control and share their identity provision. So this is about de-risking the process and helping to improve the standards of ID and V for people going through the home buying and selling process. And that's all for me. Thank you, Stuart. Glenis Debelius, Finance Profession Assurance Technical Specialist at RICS, is now going to discuss the money laundering regulations in more detail and how firms can comply with each regulation. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Stuart, as well. As Kelly said, um, my name is Glenys and I'm going to talk to you today about some of the money laundering regulations and what they mean for firms. Can I have the next slide, please, or did you give me control? You should have control, Glenys. Gave you control. Thank you. There we go. Regulation 21 is about um, money laundering reporting officers. As part of Regulation 21, all regulated firms must appoint a money laundering reporting officer, or MLRO for short. This role comes with sig a significant amount of responsibility, and the nominated officer will need to have access to the firm's records and client records to be able to provide oversight and make strategic decisions about activities regarding money laundering and financial crime. Money laundering reporting officers 
should be involved in anti-money laundering policies and procedures, in record keeping, ensuring due diligence is carried out on customers, undertaking internal and external reporting, and may also be involved in providing training to staff. A money laundering reporting officer should be suitably senior within the business. You would expect an MLRO to be senior management or director level. When thinking about who, who you should appoint as a money laundering reporting officer, you need to take into account the skills required as the individual will need to assess the money laundering risk of the business. A money laundering compliance officer, or MLCO for short, should be appointed when the size and nature of the business is appropriate. A money laundering compliance officer should ensure compliance of the regulations and undertake internal audits of the firm's anti-money laundering policies and procedures. I'm now going to hand over to Alan to talk to you about the firm's risk assessment. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to cover a few bits um, around the risk assessment as it is basically it's one of the key documents that you need. Um, you need. It ensures it covers all the risks and it needs to be updated regularly. In many ways this is sort of a cornerstone, this is a starting point and you need this first. Um, many of the risks which are an EAB or a lab will face they will already be aware of. Um, they just may not have thought about it in the context of money laundering. Um, regulation, uh, what would the regulation actually say? So regulation 18.1, it says that they must take appropriate steps to identify and assess the risks. So it's a two-part process. Identify the risks, so the business must understand and consider all of the risks appropriate to its business activities. Then they need to assess that risk, which is usually using a high, medium or low scoring method. Regulation 18.2 sets out what a business must consider when carrying out its risk assessment. So firstly, there is information provided by HMRC available on gov.uk. So you've got the National Risk Assessment, which we've already talked about, 2020. Um, the risk narrative for each of the sectors, there's one for the EAB and the labs, which is again on gov.uk. And there's also sector guidance. and there may be risk alerts which would be sent out to registered businesses around new or emerging risks. You might also want to consider things like the HMT sanctions list and Home Office published list of terrorist organisations uh, or the European Commission information on high risk third, third, third countries or reports issued by the Financial Action Task Force for international threats. Obviously on screen you've got the sort of um, the, the main risk factors, just to expand on them a little bit. So looking at the customers, um, who are your customers? Are they private individuals or are they corporate customers? Are they politically exposed or is there a specific type of customer which carries a higher risk? When you're looking at the, ge the, the geographical locations, um, so does the business have a customer who operates in a country which, ha which is deficient in its anti-money laundering or counter-terror ter terrorist financing controls? or in a country which may be unusual. Uh, when you're looking at the products or services, are there certain services which carry a higher risk than others? Transactions, uh, for example, does it have a customer who wants to deal solely in cash or transactions which are unusually large or complicated? I mean, you've got delivery channels. Are all transactions carried out face-to-face -face, or are there customers who the business never meets? Are there unusual arrangements in place to deliver regarding to deliver regarding delivery of documentation. The risk assessment needs to be specific to the business and its activities. So what's appropriate for one business is not appropriate for another. There can be a tendency to apply an industry standard or use a template available on the internet, but the risk assessment needs to be spoke to each business and no two risk assessments should be the same. Every business is slightly different. You should also note that there are templates circulating which can be used to risk assess an individual client, but this is different to requirement under, regu under Regulation 18 of risk assessments. You may wish to consider introducing a customer risk assessment in order to decide the level of due diligence which needs to be carried out. And lastly, 
a business must keep a, re a re record in writing of all the steps it has taken when carrying out its risk assessment and keeping it up to date. So basically, you need a version control. Um, so have a review date and, as I said, use a version control. Um, the, the risk assessment should also be reviewed when there is a change in circumstances. Um, so a good example of this was um, what a business would have to do to change things when the COVID restrictions came in. Um, obviously, once a business has considered all the risks, it's that they can then design, design their, their policies, controls and procedures to mitigate those risks. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks, Alan. Oh, I've gone too far. How do I go back? Click the back arrow, that might work. Can you do it, Kelly? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Regulation 19, Policies, Controls and Procedures. Under Regulation 19, firms are required to have written policies, controls and procedures for money laundering. Firms must ensure they have communicated these to all relevant staff and must also ensure they are kept up to date and any changes are also communicated. Evidence must be kept on file that the policies, controls and procedures have been approved by senior management and an audit trail must be kept of any changes made along with the evidence of this new approval. Factors that must be considered when writing your policies, controls and procedures. Risk management practices. This should include, for example, a statement of what is money laundering and the geographical scope of your work, global, national or local, for instance. Then you should consider internal controls. These should include who your money laundering report, reporting officer is, what they are responsible for, and why they are suitable for the role, how and when staff are trained, and how this is recorded, and if you have an independent audit function to monitor the money laundering reporting officer. Then you should consider customer due diligence. This should include the how, why, and when customer due diligence is undertaken, how you risk rate your customers, when to use simplified, standard or enhanced CDD, what verification documents are acceptable and how to identify sources of wealth. Then you should look at reliance and record keeping. This should include when to rely on work completed by third parties and how and what to do if that work is not sufficient how records will be kept and stored and for how long, and how to deal with GDPR conflicts. Then you should consider monitoring and management of compliance with the communication of such policies, controls and procedures. This should include how compliance with the legislation is monitored, how policies, controls and procedures should be updated and by whom, and how and when changes should be communicated. Next, we'll look at training. To comply with Regulation 24 of the regulations, a relevant person must ensure that relevant employees are aware of the law relating to money laundering and terrorist financing. Regularly give relevant employees training on how to recognise and deal with activities that could give rise to money laundering. Keep a written record of which training has been provided and to whom. Firms should also consider if it's appropriate to train other staff members who are not directly involved in anti-money laundering. Now we're going to look at customer due diligence. This is Regulation 27. You must undertake CDD on all clients where you have a business relationship. You must also undertake CDD if you suspect money laundering or have doubts regarding the identification documents provided. Customers that have an occasional transaction of 15,000 euros or more must have CDD undertaken. 
This can be one transaction or a series of linked transactions. There are three types of due diligence, simplified, standard and enhanced, which we'll go into in a bit more detail in the next slide. You need to keep records on each customer of the risk undertaken and how that risk was determined and which type of due diligence was used. If you have an existing customer, you should consider if that customer's identity has changed or if the transaction is consistent with previous transactions, as this may have an impact on your assessment of the risks. So these are the three types of customer due diligence. Let's have a look at each of them. Simplified due diligence can be undertaken for customers that are considered low risk. This type of due diligence may be appropriate for public authorities or financial institutions and should be supported by the firm's risk assessment. Simplified CDD should not be used if there are doubts over the documents or suspicion of money laundering. Standard due diligence would be used for most of your customers and must be appropriate for in, and is most appropriate for individuals, companies and trusts. This is used to identify the owner and beneficial owner, verify the identity of the customer, the nature and purpose of the transaction and checks and establishes sources of funds. Standard CDD must be undertaken on intermediaries. And then we have enhanced due diligence. This applies where there is a high risk of money laundering. It must be used when a politically exposed person or PEP has been identified or if the customer is from a high risk third country. When you are dealing with a PEP, you should also carry out checks on source of wealth as well as the source of income checks that have been that need to be undertaken. Thank you very much and I will hand back to Kelly to talk to you about the Proceeds of Crime Act. Thank you, Glenys. Another piece of legislation that is relevant to money laundering is the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002 and I'm going to talk you through the impact of this legislation on our ICS firms. So far we have discussed the relevant regulations and what firms need to do to comply with these but what happens when you are dealing with a customer who you suspect could be involved in money laundering? This is where the Proceeds of Crime Act applies. Section 330 of the Act requires firms to submit a suspicious activity report known as a SAR to the National Crime Agency if they know, suspect or have reasonable grounds for knowing or suspecting that a person is engaged in or is attempting money laundering. The National Crime Agency will then respond to either grant or deny permission to proceed with the transaction. Within a firm, usually a staff member will report their suspicions to the nominated money laundering reporting officer who will then submit the suspicious activity report if appropriate. Failure to disclose money laundering suspicions or knowledge is a criminal offence under the Act and could result in a prison sentence and or a fine. It is also an offence to let customers know that suspicious activity has been reported to the money laundering reporting officer or to the National Crime Agency. This is also known as tipping off. Tipping off, whether deliberate or inadvertent, is also a criminal offence and could result in a prison sentence and or a fine. We've discussed the relevant legislation and regulations in relation to money laundering, but smaller firms may be wondering if and how these apply to them and how they can comply. The regulations, legislation and professional statement that we have already discussed apply equally to small firms as they do to larger firms. Smaller practices can sometimes be targeted by money launderers due to the perceived lack of policies, controls and procedures. Regulation 18, risk assessments. An SME must undertake a risk assessment to mitigate identified money laundering risks to their business. Regulation 19, policies, controls and procedures. An SME must have written policies in place which detail risk management procedures, internal controls, 
customer due diligence, record keeping, and management and monitoring of these written policies. A written policy will be unique to each firm, therefore a generic template, possibly obtained from a large firm, will rarely suffice. Regulation 21, Money Laundering Reporting Officer. In an SME, the MLRO is likely to be a director, a partner, or owner in the business. In a sole principal firm, the principal will automatically be the MLRO. And in sole principal or SME firms, it is unlikely that a separate money laundering compliance officer or independent audit function will be required. Regulation 24, training. All relevant staff must be aware of AML regulations and be provided with training on how to recognise and deal with money laundering risks. Records must be retained of all training provided. And finally, Regulation 27, Customer Due Diligence. This must be undertaken on all customers in line with the firm's individual risk assessment. There is no exemption to the regulations for having a personal relationship with the client or customer. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected how businesses are able to operate, which may have also impacted their money laundering procedures. I'm now going to discuss some of these risks and how they can be mitigated. In relation to customer due diligence, the social distancing rules have meant that face-to-face -face meetings to verify original identity documents has become more difficult. Firms must ensure that all necessary steps are still taken to establish and verify a customer's identity, and they can utilise technology capabilities where this is appropriate. Firms should review their risk assessments, policies, procedures and controls and update them to reflect any changes in how they are now operating. For example, if the money laundering reporting officer is temporarily not working, a new or temporary officer should be appointed. In the final part of this presentation, I'm going to discuss the guidance and assistance that RICS offers to all of our regulated firms. Firstly, we have the RICS professional statement, which we discussed earlier on in the presentation. We also have a global insight community, which is an online space where RICS members and other property professionals can interact with one another and RICS staff to provide market insight and share latest developments. There are numerous groups within the insight community that members can join. This includes a global regulatory support and assurance group, which is dedicated to the three RICS schemes, client money, designated professional body and value registration. In this group, members can interact with the profession support and assurance teams and ask them questions. Finally, please look out for the next AML webinar, which is coming later this year, and will be focused on customer due diligence, which we have briefly discussed as part of this presentation. This webinar will go into much more detail on the three different types of customer due diligence and how electronic identification services can assist firms with their due diligence. I am now going to hand you over to Ollie Thornton Berry from Third Fort, who is going to introduce his AML compliance product and give you a flavour of what is to come in the next AML webinar. Thank you so much for that. Um, just briefly uh, introducing Third Fort. So, firstly, I recognise that for agents out there, AML is getting harder. That's that's the first point. Um, we speak to lots of estate agents on a daily basis. And we recognize that the challenges um, in compliance are just getting harder almost by the day. And if you go back five years, it was a completely different landscape. Uh, COVID accelerated uh, the number of fraudulent attacks on property for both money laundering, but also ID fraud. Um, we've come across many more instances of people trying to sell properties they don't own. Uh, the, fa the famous one being Mishcon uh, and Dreamvar, where a client sold a flat in uh, Earl's Court for 1.2 million uh, to a buyer all in cash. Um, the buyer turned up to, to move into that property and discovered that, that the seller hadn't actually sold it. It was a fraud, so they changed their identity uh, to sell that. So we're seeing uh, more of these attacks happen all over the place in the property transaction. Uh, lawyers are the most highly regulated. I think everyone knows that. But increasingly, we're seeing estate agents are now regulated and overseen to a much similar standard to property lawyers. 
which is why you know we very much started where uh, regulation was most onerous so so with the property lawyers and in the just over uh, two years since we've launched uh, we signed up around 600 law firms uh, currently onboarding around 35,000 of their clients a month and now we've seen over the past six months huge demand from the estate agency space to use our same uh, the technology that is driven by open banking uh, as well as digital ID and with open banking you can get bank statements from your clients in in a matter of seconds through us through a secure uh, mobile phone app so we've seen huge demand from some of the larger estate agents to to start utilizing this type of technology purely because it's saving so much time uh, in filling out all this paperwork and as we know you know as busy estate agents when especially in a busy market you want to get on and, and sell as many properties as possible as well as making sure that you've got the risk technology uh, to cover any uh, any of these um, emerging risks and compliance problems uh, with AML so since we started selectively working with some agents we've got the likes of Mike Frank rolling us out Strutton Parker Dexter's and a few others and, and kind of due to the recent demand we've we, we've set up a waiting list uh, for firms ahead of a full-blown launch uh, into October but there's going to be much more around um, how this technology can save you you know anywhere from kind of half an hour to around three hours of a form filling an admin i mean doing your your own aml but with a uh, technology that that your house buyers and sellers the clients uh, that you deal with will, will absolutely love there's an app that feels and looks as good as revolut or deliveroo to operate um, in a totally kind of watertight um, technology environment um, and it's just going to save so much time I'm in doing AML and massively reduce the risk. So I know that what you've heard today is, you know, very scary and the amount of admin that people have to do. What we're doing is building solutions to help facilitate your operations and massively reduce uh, the amount of paperwork um, and stress for, for you and your, your businesses. But as I say, more on this um, in the upcoming webinar we're doing with the RACS. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ollie. Now going to move on to the Q&A section of the webinar. So the panelists, Chrissy O'Rourke, Alan Patrick, and Stuart Young are going to come on screen and answer some of your questions. Okay. So just looking for the questions now. Had one about managing agents, which was Hi, Kelly, do you want, Yeah, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, have you have you got it in front of you? I have. So the question that was asked was about um, somebody who's a managing agent of a of a block, and and um, I think it was a commercial block specifically. Uh, perhaps doesn't fall into the definition um, of an estate agent or a or a letting agent. Um, uh, but do they have to do uh, money laundering checks on the tenants, um, even if they've inherited them from a, a previous agent? Um, so I think that Alex from HMRC has provided an answer to that from the sort of HMRC point of view, which is really about, you know, it, it's very hard for them to answer without um, some understanding of exactly whether or not the, the person falls with it, the business falls within the legal definition of a, of a letting agency or, a, or an estate agency. But working from the assumption that, that the person asking the question is, is correct, that their business doesn't fall within that, that definition, there's still the RICS professional statement to consider, which um, obviously is, uh, goes beyond the, the legal requirement around um, anti-money laundering re registration and regulation um, in order to ensure that from an ethical point of view, none of our members and firms are um, facilitating money laundering. Um, and the answer from that point of view really is around risk assessment. So obviously Alan's spoken about risk assessment in relation to regulated businesses. We would expect unregulated RICS firms to go through a similar process. What kind of work do we do? What kind of clients are we dealing with? Where are they situated? What kind of risks does that give rise to? And obviously, Alan gave an example earlier about the possibility of a criminal business setting up complex um, corporate structures that might allow for, you know, the owner to, of a business, the owner of a building, to then have a tenant in that building, which is really a money laundering relationship. Um, so you'll 
so as a as a managing agent i would very much expect that you will have done identity checks on your client on the owner of the business presumably the the freeholder um and you'll understand them, you'll understand the kind of risks that they give rise to. I would hope you'd also have some understanding, of course, of who the tenants are, um, you know, even if you haven't done sort of identity checks on them, um, and that that will allow you to then do a risk assessment um, and consider, do you need to do identity checks? Are there any, um, you know, are there any connections there that you need to worry about? Are you in an in a particular area? Is your is the amount of rent the the kind of businesses um, that are within that property the kind of thing that you need to be concerned about? Um, and maybe you do need to do those checks um, if your risk assessment suggests that you do. And you might want to do them on a kind of you know rolling basis anyway. It's always good, I think, particularly when you're dealing with client money, to understand who you're dealing with um, and and have have you know, have surety about about those those people's identity. So that would be my answer. It's really about your risk assessment as a business, who your client is, who those other customers, those, those tenants are, um, making sure you understand that, and then making sensible calls from there about what level of of, of identity check you might need to do. Um, Alan, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. I mean, it's not really an HMRC question. It's it's more of an RICS no. one. But... Yeah, I don't think there's anything else from my side. Thank you. Okay, but hopefully that, that helps with answering the question. Thanks, Chrissy. Alan, I think this is one you probably would be able to answer. It says, regarding link transactions, is this solely for the selling of artwork? Um, not just artwork. I mean, in theory, it's a link transaction is when something is done, when payment is done in an artificial way. So, yes, traditionally it would be for buying or selling a goods, but um, in theory, it could be for, for um a property purchase and and it could be again it could be for a, a letting agent so it, it it's it's when you you're looking at a payment which is artificially split up so instead of someone paying you say rent of twenty thousand pounds they pay it in ten lots of one thousand pounds and if they're paying in cash that might have been paid into a bank account now why would they pay it in 20 lots of one thousand pounds rather than just not paying the twenty thousand pounds all in one go uh, the reason being is if you paid for £20,000 in cash into the bank, the bank would question it uh, and ask for checks. Where if you pay it in, say, in 20 lots of £1,000, um, it would off it, the, the bank may not make do any checks. It would just look like a normal transaction. Um, so it's not quite as simple. I mean, it, one of my favourite uh, responses, it does depend. Um, but it is basically looking to see if a, um, a transaction is artificially broken down and is paid in a way which is not what we would normally expect. And if they're doing that, why are they doing that? Thank you, Chrissy. I think this is one you could answer and possibly link to the earlier question that you answered. Do checks have to be done on both sides of the transaction for commercial lease renewals or residential lease extensions? So, obviously, if it's over the, um, if you're looking at, amounts of rent where it brings it within the the regulated space um, my understanding to that is is yes absolutely um, you have to to do um, checks on both parties um, and then from the point of view of the RICS professional statement so if you're below that those sorts of levels um, it's going to be down to your risk assessment um, I mean I would have thought that in most circumstances you're going to want to do even if it's only basic identity checks, you're going to want to do those um, because if you don't understand that, um, then it's very hard to assess your risks. Uh, but that I think that, I mean, certainly that's my understanding of, of what's required in the regulated space. Um, and I think it would be, you know, unless you really are dealing with extremely well-known clients, something which for some reason you, you view as not being a risk. Um, I would have said that that's probably good practice, um, you know, even outside the regulated space. Thank you. Alan, this is something you discussed during the presentation, so you're probably best placed to answer this. It's asking for risk assessment templates and model or sample compliance documents from either ourselves or yourselves. Um, we do not have anything like that. We, there, there is, we, don't, have, we don't produce anything like that because there is we don't want to have a bespoke something which is generic um it's completely down to a business to decide what what they use and how they do it um 
there are, as I said before, there are various ones out there. And it's not a problem if you use a generic document, but you then must tailor that yourself to your business. Um, the problem we sometimes see is when a business purchases a generic document or, or obtains a generic document online and then just applies that it says that's it but they've not looked at it we have had times when we've seen these documents and sometimes they even have the wrong business name on them they haven't got as far as even updating that that much so if we don't have anything as such um because we don't produce anything like that but i mean there are some available online but as i said if you do get something like that you must tailor it to your to your business okay and the next question whoever feels best place to answer what risk assessments are needed for surveys and valuations where they're not selling the property they're just undertaking the survey evaluation so that's probably one for me to answer because it's not in the regulated space so hmrc probably don't have a view um on the face of it that seems like very low risk work um you know you're not handling client money um you're not you know you're not facilitating i mean although you're facilitating the the transaction in the sense of providing some of the information which goes towards it um you know you're not you're not sort of legally facilitating the the transaction um i would have said that in those circumstances your risk assessment can probably be um fairly straightforward quite quite brief but we would still expect you to do one you know is there anything about the kind of transactions that you're you're dealing with you know if you were dealing with super prime property say or you were dealing with um very complex uh or you were dealing with um uh sort of an, an overseas corporate client something like that you still need to be aware that you have a responsibility if you suspect money laundering to um to report it so you know if you are if for any reason there's there's something that alerts you that that this looks suspicious um you're maybe dealing you know you you become aware that somebody's a, a pep say dealing with super prime property um and there's anything about you know you're dealing with that person or their agents or something else that makes you suspicious you may want to be in a position to understand what your responsibilities are to um you know under the from an ethical point of view to report those sorts of things but on the whole it seems like it's it's likely to be low risk work you're likely to be able to have a fairly straightforward risk assessment um uh, you know if you understand what money laundering is and what the what the expectations are in terms of you know not facilitating that um then you you can probably you, you know you're not going to need to be doing sort of identity checks and things like that on people on the whole thank you chrissy alan probably one for yourself are there any circumstances when aml checks for a mutual client can be passed between a solicitor for a client and the estate agent acting for the same clients saving duplication of the checks a good question which i'm not 100 percent sure on i mean i think this is sort of when we're getting into the terms of reliance um which yeah. is covered in the regulations um there's not a problem with um different businesses using reliance um the regulations are there i think the key thing with when you're using reliance though is that whichever business is is asking another business to, to reliance for us as a supervisor we're concerned about you as a business not the business you're relying on. So if you rely on another business to, to do, say, your customer due diligence and they don't do it correctly, but you presume they have, then you have a business which would, would, would possibly could have a penalty or, or some sort of sanction put against you because you haven't done um, the, the required CDD. Um, the reg it's under Regulation 39. It does clearly state in the regulations what you need to do. Um, it's not quite as simple as saying someone else does it that's all that's done there are requirements you do need to know who the customer is you need to know what level of customer due diligence was done and you must be able to get the documents immediately on request um one of those interesting words what does immediately wrong request means but in theory that means if hmrc come for inspection and you don't have the documents you need to be able to have be able to obtain those documents we would recommend that if you are using reliance that you get those documents at that time so you can review them and so you are satisfied yourself that all the, the relevant customer due diligence has been done and then obviously if you're not satisfied then you can um, do some extra customer due diligence yourself 
Thank you. Chrissy. I think this is one for you. Um, I work for an RICS regulated firm of building surveyors and valuers, providing home buyer reports. We have an external firm that handles all of our payments and receipts. What AML steps, if any, must we take internally? Again, I think it's the it's a similar answer to the, the previous question I answered. Do a risk assessment. Look at what you're doing write down somewhere what your risk assessment is that you know that you the work that you're doing is is low risk um, and you know and as long as you have that do some training have some understanding of of money laundering you know as people are doing here you know you can you can evidence that you've that you've done the training here um, put that in your risk assessment um, think about any other staff members that might need to know about it um, and that's probably um, you know that's probably sufficient in terms of the kind of that kind of work, unless there's anything unusual about what you do. Okay, Alan, this question is in relation to your slides. What does EAB and LAB stand for? Uh, that's Estate Agents Businesses and Letting Agent Businesses. Um, there was one other in there I saw. If you wanted me to do about the, the, yeah, the level of rent and why about euros and pounds. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just just to explain, um, it's set in euros because the regulations are based on the European Money Laundering Directives. So that's why it's set in euros. I mean, it does clearly state in that that even though it's in, in euros, it's equivalent to another amount in currency. Um, as into what the UK currency, I mean, that changes on a daily basis. Um, so you need to go and check what that is. Um, I don't actually know what it is, probably about eight, somewhere between eight and a half, nine thousand pounds, roughly, I'd thought at the moment. Um, however, there is on gov.uk, there is a, um, a monthly exchange rate for each month of the year, which goes back a long time. Um, and, and this covers not just euros, but all currencies around the world. And it's a monthly agreed exchange rate. So that is what we would use as, as a base rate as to what the exchange rate would be. So um, if you go on gov.uk, you'll be able to find that list um, and, and it will show you for each month what the what the agreed exchange rate is for that month. OK, this is this is, I guess, a question for all of you. This is quite interesting in terms of additional resource required and additional costs with even more legislation and regulation. Who bears the cost of this? Is this passed on to the client or is it borne by the ultimate end user, i.e. the tenant? It's probably more of an opinion question than. Um... Than anything factual, but any thoughts? I can start on this if you want. Yes, thank you, Stuart. Um, the My Identity scheme is all about putting, if you look at the DCMS policies, by putting consumer in control of their own identity and their own data with the ability to control and share that. So that has an implication on the cost because we know that the current processes and procedures of a solicitor does My ID and V, that identity results are sent back to the solicitor and they use that and they won't share that with anyone else and this kind of ties into another question that was asked about the sharing of an identity and if we look at the, what the My Identity Scheme is doing it's about helping the consumer to have that ability to share their identity with whomever that they want so if it's done through a certified identity provider they can share that with their estate if it's been done through the estate agent they can then share it with the conveyancer their mortgage intermediary and their mortgage lender. Who pays for it is a, an interesting one because the current model is that um, identity providers are B2B enterprises. But what's happening through the My Identity Scheme and what is a, a desire of the DCMS and what we're designing into the scheme is to enable a consumer to get their own ID and V done and to pay for that directly themselves if they want to. Now, the cost can still be covered by an estate agent if they want to do it as part of their service offering or the conveyance or whoever it might be. But through that, what's very clear through the scheme and the regulation and the design of the DCMS Digital Identity and Attributes Trust Framework is that the consumer owns their identity, irrespective of who pays for it. So the scheme is designing that in that the consumer can pay for it directly themselves. And two bits of research came out this year both fully evidencing and highlighting that consumers are happy to pay for their own ID and V to control it and share it. And in one of those bits of research, it was done through an estate agency group, um, one of the big ones, 799 respondents, and just over 80% said they prefer to manage, pay for and manage their own identity and have the ability to share that with other people. So that's great for the industry because it takes that immediate cost off the a state agent if they're or the conveyancer or mortgage intermediary 
and just pushes it directly onto the client. You can pay for it and then share it. So it helps with onboarding and takes that immediate administrative cost off the um, businesses or the relying parties through the process. It's one of the options that said as part of the My Identity Scheme. Thank you, Stuart. Um, a question that, that you might be able to answer also is to do with um, electronic identification services. It says, if you were using a third party provider to undertake AML ID checks, is it still essential to see original identity documents? Um, no, it's not. What this is designed is the there's an output of a certificate that highlights a brief level who the person is, that we know who they are and who they say they are with the checks that have been done against them. So under the regulations that, that are coming through, it is not a, an actual requirement. However, what we've designed into the pilot is to allow for the giving of that evidence because culturally there are still certain sectors that like to have all that evidence and there may be incidences where that further evidence will be required. So it does support the sharing and giving of that information where required, but it's not an actual requirement. You don't need it. Great, thank you. Alan, I think you might be able to answer this one. Please, can we have a quick summary of the differences between money laundering and terrorist financing? Um, I mean, money laundering is basically the process um, of when you, you, you're taking money um, attained from crimes. Um, and it can, where, where uh, terrorist financing is um, funding terrorist activities in a, sim in a very sim simplest. I mean, the risk of terrorist financing, which I'm not sure I've actually mentioned this earlier, um, for the EAB and labs is low. Um, for some of our other sectors, uh, we see prices quite high, but for estate agents, it's, it is fairly low. Um, the biggest risks which any AB and a lab will face will pro undoubtedly be uh, relating to money laundering. So, I mean, basi and basically with money laundering, it is the ways which criminals are getting money and they're trying to clean it. Um, there's lots of there's different methods of doing it. There's different stages of it. Um, but basically, they're, they're trying to get their criminal assets and money um, and they're trying to whether it's from buying a house renting something or buying something else they're trying to make it look come out the other side looking like it's clean money or have some asset to show for which could be in this instance a property great thank you and we've had another question i think um could be for you as well alan what is the easiest way to view the definitive list of peps if there is one um I don't think it's definitive left list, but I mean straight away I'd take I'd say go to our regulations, uh, regulation 35, uh, and I think it's 3512 off the top. I'm, I'm looking at something else which someone else has said. Yeah, 3512. Um, so there is a list in there about what it is. Um, I'm not going to read it all to you because it's there's quite a lot in there and it'll take quite a while. But yeah, go, go to regulations and, and look at regulation 35, uh, power 12, which should give you a lot more information. Okay, I'm just checking if we've had, haven't had any more questions come in. I think there's a question at the end, um, oh, Kelly, which I, I'm not sure I, I entirely understand it, which says, do you think some foundations are involved in money laundering? Um, I don't know if that means sort of charitable foundations or, uh, I mean, I, Alan, I don't know if there's an answer to that. I'm assuming that potentially any sort of structure could be involved in money laundering. Um, I'm not, I, I, I also am not 100% sure on the question, but yeah, um, a charity can be involved um, and it has been known for terrorist organisations to use charities to launder their money. Um, so yeah, it, it, if, I think that's what we're talking about. I mean, but I mean, a charity just needs to be like anything aware of the possibilities that a criminal may use them to launder their money. Um, and so I presume that's what we're on about, but we'd need a little bit more information. So I'll just ask Alan if you can repeat your bit about PEPs, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so PEPs regulation, go, go to the money laundering regulations, regulation 35 para 12. Is that the definition of a PEP, Alan? Does that is does that help got, you to decide who's a PEP? Yes, it's got. I'm just going to give me one second. Let me find it, and I'll tell you. 
Uh, so Regulation 35 covers enhanced customer due diligence for politically exposed persons, and it goes on lots of details. And when you get down to 12, um, yes, it goes down about um, politically exposed persons, about who it is in an individual, uh, someone who's in a prominent public, middle ranking, junior official, whether it's um, a family members um, and close associates. So basically, and then when you get into uh, 14 events got some more information about who it covers like heads of states members of parliament etc are there any sort of publicly available lists that a, a person could use you know if they know that somebody is domiciled in germany to find out who peps in germany are is, is there anything like that available for people or is it is it more that you need to do your own you know google your person and, and then look at them against the definition i don't know off the top of my head i think it's more you need to have a look um um, but um, I will let you know. As far, yeah, as far as I know, there is no list, unfortunately. Uh, it's something you would need to look into for that individual person and, and obviously who they are, what they do uh, and what happens in that country. I mean, I guess the process of finding out where their funds have come from may give you a clue about whether or not they're a PEP as well. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> OK, we haven't had any more questions come through. I'll just leave it for one more minute if anyone has any last minute questions they want to add in. Okay, I think that's it. So thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you to you, Christy, Alan and Stuart for presenting with us today and look out for the next webinar, hopefully later this year. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for you. having me. Cheers, thank thanks. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you.